This program is sponsored in part by the Elizabethtown College Summer Scholarship, Creative Arts, and Research Projects. Elizabethtown College, educate for service. I myself would say, and it's a pity we don't have another hour to debate this, that quantum mechanics is the greatest intellectual achievement of the 20th century. Given episodes one through eight, you now have enough information to understand and appreciate the beautiful coherence underlying Einstein's double revolution that I will reveal in this episode. Essentially, I'm going to show you how no preferred reference frame underwrites Merman's two pedagogical examples. Those being the relativity of simultaneity for special relativity in episode three, and the Merman device for quantum mechanics in the last episode. These facts are characterized by the so-called spin singlet state in quantum mechanics which I'll review conceptually here in a minute. Apparently, according to the spin singlet state, it just doesn't matter that definite values for unmeasured properties of quantum particles don't exist. About this fact, Einstein once said, I believe the moon is there when nobody is looking. So the belief that objects possess properties, whether or not we choose to measure them, is called realism. And again, Smolin recently used the apparent anti-realism or no counterfactual definiteness implication of quantum mechanics to claim and the real story, the point of view that I want to discuss today, is that in fact it doesn't make any sense because it's wrong. Lee is bothered because it would seem that quantum mechanics is incomplete since quantum particles must surely possess values for unmeasured properties. At very least, quantum systems should possess some dynamical mechanism, like Merman's instruction sets, for producing the appropriate values when measured, right? Indeed, as Einstein's quote about the moon shows, he was also bothered by this behavior of quantum particles. It's one of the reasons he defined bodily objects as he did in the context of the real external world, which I shared with you in episode one. But as we will see, this complaint results from dynamical bias. That is, an attempt to tell dynamical stories about entangled quantum systems. Now, Lee is correct in that there are two aspects of Einstein's revolution that remain unfinished. We need to reconcile quantum physics with general relativity, and we need to understand what quantum mechanics is telling us about the real external world, aka physical reality. But he is mistaken in his belief that we don't understand quantum mechanics because it's wrong. The physics is correct. As Merman pointed out, the reason it doesn't make any sense is due to the dynamical bias from the ANSI view of its practitioners. As I will now show, not only is quantum mechanics not wrong, but it is actually based on the same principle, no preferred reference frame, as Einstein's other revolution, relativity theory. Thus, modern physics is quite complete and self-consistent in this regard. Just as no preferred reference frame led to the relativity of simultaneity and special relativity, thus resolving all the mysteries of general relativity, no preferred reference frame leads to conservation on average in quantum mechanics. As we will see, this is an adynamical global constraint with no dynamical slash causal counterpart, and that is why us ants find the quantum spin singlet state so mysterious, counterintuitive. It violates our dynamical sensibilities. Typically, adynamical global constraints have dynamical counterparts to explain them. For example, conservation of momentum obtains when the sum of the forces equals zero. Conservation of angular momentum obtains when the sum of the torques equals zero. Uh, Fermat's principle of least time in episode two can be explained dynamically by Snell's law for the refraction of light. So when we have an adynamical global constraint without a dynamical counterpart, our dynamical expectation is violated. For example, everyone measures the same speed of light because there's no preferred reference frame. But what mechanism enforces it? Certainly such a constraint can't be explanatory without itself being explained by some corresponding dynamical mechanism, right? But if we rise to Wilczek's challenge and ascend to the all-at-once view of physical reality, we can accept that adynamical global constraints are in fact fundamental and therefore do not need to be explained dynamically. And again, the ultimate reason for our adynamical global constraints is no preferred reference frame. That is, to use Einstein's language, no one's sense experiences can provide a privileged perspective on the real external world. So the explanatory hierarchy is actually adynamical global constraints due to the egalitarian nature of our sense experiences, giving rise to dynamical stories for classical mechanics about bodily objects that interact by the quantum exchange of momentum for quantum mechanics. Let me show you here how that holds for the Merman device. Again, with the Merman device, we're going to be talking about the property of spin, where you get deflection up or down relative to your north and south poles of your Stern-Gerlach magnets. 
and we're going to denote those outcomes by plus 1 and minus 1. And we have a source of spin-entangled particles, Alice and Bob, obtaining outcomes plus 1, minus 1, minus 1, plus 1, for any of their configurational settings, 1, 2, or 3. And here again is the quantum phenomenon, the spin singlet state it's based on. Let's look at the phenomena. Uh, the spin singlet state here for Alice and Bob, making measurements with their stern gerlach magnets at changing orientations. We'll represent the orientation of Alice's and Bob's stern gerlach magnets with these blue arrows and the outcomes by the yellow dots. So here we see Alice got a spin up and Bob got a spin down. And here we see, again, the turn gear lock magnets are aligned. Alice got minus one, and Bob got plus one. That correlation function, you multiply the outcomes together, is minus one for theta equals zero. That's the angle between the stern gear lock magnets. Here, they're co-aligned. What we see happens Say as Bob starts to rotate his stern gerlach magnet with respect to Alice's, we still mostly get plus one, minus one, or minus one, plus one in those trials. But we do start to see some minus one, minus ones, and plus one, plus ones. Small fraction of the trials begin to have correlations of plus one. Overall, going from negative one here and you're growing a little bit adding a few of the plus ones so you're growing from minus one moving less negatively towards zero and when theta equals 90 degrees in fact you do get all four possible outcomes with equal frequency and so your correlation function is zero for theta equals 90 degrees. Continues to grow until at theta equals 180 degrees we have a correlation plus one minus one times minus one is plus one. So your correlation function is plus 1 for theta equals 180 degrees. To summarize this fact, the correlation function is minus cosine theta. As it turns out, this correlation function, minus cosine theta, describes exactly the mysterious facts 1 and 2 from the quantum entangled spin singlet state, as shown by the Merman device. Thus, what we need to do is find the physical principle responsible for this minus cos and theta correlation function. I'll spare you the mathematical details. If you're interested, you can see a complete explanation here, suitable for someone who has taken introductory physics. Luckily, for those of you who haven't taken an intro physics course, you don't need to understand the detailed physics to understand the adynamical explanation. As it turns out, we can derive our minus cos and theta correlation function by simply assuming we have conservation for no preferred reference frame. So, we're trying to explain our correlation function of minus cosine theta. Let's look at the phenomena. Say all the trials where the stern gerlach magnets are aligned and Alice gets plus one. We notice that Bob always gets minus one. It's as if Alice is measuring a vector quantity pointed up unit length while Bob is measuring a vector quantity of unit length but pointed down so that they exactly cancel out. And indeed, this is the way the spin singlet state is understood. It's conservation of spin angular momentum in amounts given by h bar over 2, where h is Planck's constant in units of angular momentum, and h bar is Planck's constant divided by 2 pi. Now, if that's the case, then Alice would argue when she gets plus one, and Bob has angled his stern gerlach magnet at theta relative to hers, he shouldn't be getting minus one. 
let alone anything like plus one, you should be getting the projection of that minus one angular momentum pointed down along his measurement direction. So that should be minus one times the cosine of the angle between the stern gerlach magnets, or negative cosine theta. And so in this case, it looks like, well, maybe negative 0.8 is what he should have gotten. So let us posit, since Bob is always going to measure plus one and minus one, just like Alice, per no preferred reference frame, that Bob's plus one and minus one outcomes at theta will average the negative 0 0.8 corresponding to Alice's plus one outcome. And then as the angle increases, that projection along the Bob's measurement direction decreases. Here, of course, the projection of the vector straight down has nothing along the orthogonal direction horizontally. And now the vector straight down has a projection this way, which is bored positive for Bob's orientation, increasing until when they're anti-aligned again. All of Alice's plus ones result in the full minus one down for Bob, which now, given that his stern gerlach magnet is upside down, becomes a plus one outcome. Turns out, this assumption where you have the conservation on average gives you exactly a correlation function of minus cosine theta. Notice how this phenomenon mirrors that of special relativity. In special relativity, Alice is moving at velocity VA relative to a light source and measures the speed of light from that source to BC. Bob is moving at velocity VB relative to that same light source and measures the speed of light from that source to be C. Here, reference frame refers to the relative motion of the observer and source, which then defines a specific measurement of a specific quantity in the context of all its alternatives. But no preferred reference frame in this context thus means all measurements produce the same outcome, C. As a consequence of this constraint and no preferred reference frame proper, giving the relativity positive of a special relativity, one obtains the relativity of simultaneity and the all-at-once view per Wilczek's challenge, as I explained in episode 3, on the Bloch universe and special relativity. In quantum mechanics, Alice orients her stern gerlach magnet at alpha relative to a source of spin-entangled particles and measures plus 1 or minus 1 h bar 2. Bob orients his stern gerlach magnet at beta relative to that same source of spin-entangled particles and measures plus 1 or minus 1 h bar over 2. Here, reference frame refers to the relative orientation of the stern gerlach magnets and source, which then defines a specific measurement of a specific quantity in the context of all its alternatives. No preferred reference frame in this context means all measurements produce the same outcome, plus 1 or minus 1, h bar over 2. This means we can only conserve angular momentum on average between different reference frames. As a consequence of this constraint and no preferred reference frame proper, giving equal mixed probabilities between Alice and Bob, one obtains the quantum state, that is, the probability for each possible measurement outcome, which is the spin singlet state of quantum mechanics. So what we have as a result of the fact that Alice measures plus one and minus one, h bar over two, for any and all stern gerlach magnet orientations relative to the source, and Bob measures plus one and minus one, h bar over two, for all his stern gerlach magnet orientations, relative to the source, per no preferred reference frame, is that we can only satisfy our conservation on average, and the stern gerlach magnets are in different orientations. In other words, in all the trials where Alice measures plus one and Bob measures at some other orientation, stern gerlach magnets, his plus one and minus one outcomes will average to what we would expect to satisfy our conservation principle. And as that angle changes, the average and changes accordingly. And Bob can say the same thing about Alice because he measures plus one and minus one with equal frequency, just as she does. And this reminds us of something from special relativity that 
everyone has to measure the same speed of light, regardless of their motion relative to the source, i.e. regardless of their reference frame, leads to the fact that Sarah, Kim, and Alice will say that Joe and Bob's meter sticks are short and their clocks run slow, while Joe and Bob will say the same thing about Sarah, Kim, and Alice's meter sticks and clocks. We showed that events 1 and 2 are simultaneous in the reference frame for the boys, so that they said the distance between Sarah and Kim is not 1,250 kilometers, but only 1,000. The boys say the girls' meter sticks are short. Now the girls will say it's events 1 and 3 that are simultaneous, and therefore the distance between Joe and Bob is in the 1,000, but it's only 800 kilometers. That is, the girls say the boys' meter sticks are short. So, in special relativity, we have this empirical fact. Alice and Bob both measure the same speed of light, c, regardless of their reference frame, regardless of their motion relative to the source. In quantum mechanics, we have this empirical fact. that Alice and Bob both measure plus 1 or minus 1 h bar over 2, regardless of their reference frame, i.e. regardless of their stern gerlach orientations relative to the source. As a consequence, special relativity, Alice will say of Bob, that his clocks run slow and his meter sticks are short, while Bob will say exactly the same thing about Alice. It's her clocks that run slow and her meter sticks that are short. In quantum mechanics, Alice will say of Bob that he must average his results to obtain the proper conservation principle. And Bob will say the exact same thing about Alice, that she's the one that must average her results to obtain the proper conservation principle. And the oddity is the mystery of special relativity therefore resides because of no preferred reference frame and the fact that whether or not two events happen at the same time is relative. Uh, for the boys, events 1 and 2 are simultaneous, while for the girls, events 1 and 3 are simultaneous. In quantum mechanics, the mystery resides precisely in the fact that there is no preferred reference frame leading to an average-only conservation. In other words, there is no explanation for why you have conservation on a trial-by-trial -trial basis. The conservation principle is only explanatory when you look at a collection of events as a whole. And that's precisely why special relativity and quantum mechanics have the mysteries that they do, residing ultimately in the fact that there is no preferred reference frame. Therefore, as a physicist reader of Merman's AJP paper, Quantum Mysteries for Anybody, my explanation for the general reader is the Merman device works because of conservation per no preferred reference frame thus revealing a beautiful coherence with relativity theory. So, as with the other puzzles, problems, and paradoxes of modern physics, this quantum mystery for anybody is resolved by ascending to the all-at-once view per Wilczek's challenge. Once you can accept that a-dynamical global constraints in space-time are fundamental to dynamical stories, you are privy to the underlying coherence of modern physics, which ultimately resides in the fact that no one's sense experiences can provide a privileged perspective on the real external world. Maybe you're even ready to give up your anthropocentric dynamical bias and move beyond the dynamical universe.